Good morning and welcome to Life Church. Stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. If you're a guest with us today, let me say welcome, and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is to download the Live Church Emporia app from iTunes or Google Play and select the tile that says New Here. That'll help us get you plugged in to Life Church. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. Life Church, we have a number of ways that you can connect this week, and a great place to find all of that information is the digital bulletin on the Life Church Emporia app. You can also find information about connecting on our Facebook page as well as Instagram. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. Life Church, thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. Because you've been faithful, we've been able to continue supporting missionaries and ministries at home and around the globe. If you were at the annual business meeting, you heard that in 2020, we were able to even add missionaries and ministries, and the gospel is being spread. And that's thanks to your giving. If you have questions about giving, please go to lifechurchemporia.com slash give. Or if you've downloaded the Life Church Emporia app, you can give through the give tile. If you want to give through text, you can text 620-236-6789. And if you're in the building, you'll notice that there are offering baskets and envelopes next to each door. If you've got any questions about giving, please contact Sarah Jennings. Now stay tuned. The Sunday experience is about to begin. Life Church, we have an opportunity to minister right here in Emporia, and that is we are partnering with Walnut Elementary to collect donations of new blankets, new twin size sheet sets, and new pillows for kids in need. The blankets are their biggest need, and so if you want to find something in a kid print or basic color to donate, you, that is very welcome. Please make sure that all donations are in their new and original packaging. And they can be left in the totes in the foyer or you can drop them off by the office anytime during the week, Tuesday through Friday. If you have any questions, please call the office at 620-342-8620. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin.
stand together today? <laughs> Go get him if you need him. Jesus, we love you. Father God, we dedicate these next, I, I never know how long it's going to be. Sorry, I wish I could. This next at least 90 minutes to you, Jesus, and beyond. <laughs> Father God, come and have your way in us and through us. Do what only you can do in your people today. Amen. How many of you can start this service off by saying, I need a change in my life <laughs> from God, one that only God can do. Amen. So today we're believing for God to move in us, to move through us, to move on our behalf. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that we get to ask you for that and you come through. You are worthy of our praise. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I try to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my
Amen. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. And we have, we have some people today that are wanting to demonstrate they love the Lord God with all their heart, mind, soul, strength. And, and so today, right now, guys, everybody just say hi to Tristan. This is Tristan Newson, and so families are here, and so glad to see the families here. Today, Tristan, upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody, ooh, ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. everybody, this is Angela, and everybody say hi, Angela. Hi, Angela. And she has just begun coming, her and her family, and so we are so glad she is here. Not only that, but she has decided to commit herself to the Lord for good. Like, she's wanting to say, hey, this is, this is, this is what I'm saying, so, which is awesome. So God's been working in her life. She, we talked this week, and tears stream down her face because the Lord's working in her life. And so how many of you love that? Isn't that awesome? So today, uh, Angela, as a result, upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Next, we have Bella. Everybody say hi, Bella. Bella loves the Lord. She wants to follow Jesus. So she's, how many of you know that sometimes when kids say, hey, we want to be baptized, that there needs to be an understanding there, right? Amen. So, so we, are, we are making sure that happens behind the scenes. But I, wanted, I want you to know something. Bella loves Jesus with all of her heart. She loves him and she wants to serve him. And so today we're excited about their entire family, uh, serving the Lord, walking in the Lord. And so today, Bella, upon your confession of faith, because you love Jesus so much, we now baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is same family. Everybody say hi, Ann. You say hi back. Hi. <laughs> she said hi back. So today, she loves Jesus with all of her heart, and she wants to serve the Lord and, and follow him. And how many of you love it when our kids in kids ministry under Miss Jamie, they, they want to serve God? They, you know what I mean? They just have this heart to want to go after the Lord. And so today, Ann, upon on your confession of faith, I now... Baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh. Yes, okay. Very good. You can come around the side here. There you go. This is Jakia. Everybody say hi, Jakia. Can I tell you something? Jakia got saved, was it two weeks ago, last week? I'm saying this. When did, you get, when did, you, when did she lead you to the Lord? It was last week. Isn't that exciting? So I'm just saying we had somebody in the church was just talking to about, talking to about the Lord, and, and so they just started kind of meeting, and she just decided to start following the Lord, and Today, uh, Jakia, upon your confession of faith, I'm going to have you go ahead and cover that nose, so I don't want you to... I now baptize you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes, let's celebrate with them Amen. today. Yes. Thank you, God, that you are moving. Thank you, God, that you are changing lives. Thank you, God, that people are choosing to follow you. Let's sing this bridge one more time as a testimony of where God has brought us from. Amen. Let's sing this out. I need a rescue. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break and the weight of your glory. I need a chest.
worship him celebration it's the joining of the bride and the son the two becoming one all the pro
listening through these songs this week trying to put the set together and one of my kids is like mom what's a savior I'm like Jesus is the savior like the person that comes and saves us all <laughs> Duh. Like, he's a superhero he's the best and he started singing who's the savior Jesus who's the savior Jesus <laughs> so all week all my kids come in who's the savior and we all Jesus <laughs> so good it's so good to come to that realization that truly he is our savior Amen. If you have yet to experience that in Jesus, just like these songs I'll say, he literally can take your sorrow and replace that with his joy. You literally can come to him regardless of what you did last night or this morning. You don't have to dress yourself up enough to come to our God. He takes us as we are. And let's be honest, if you tried to pretty yourself up, there's nothing that you could do that's enough. So just don't try. Just come as you are. 
Come and receive Jesus. Come and receive what he has to offer because it's so good. Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a big, loud shout. And you all can be seated. Yes, Jesus. Welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. Uh, can we give all of our guests, both online as well as in person, can we give everyone that's a guest here a warm Life Church welcome? So glad you're here today. Thank you for being with us. Uh, as you know, last week we began a new series in, uh, on the book of Romans, and, and if you're with us, it's one of the most significant books in the New Testament. In fact, I think it would be safe to say that it's done more for Western civilization and Christianity more than any other book in the, in the New Testament. In fact, many have called this book the uh, gospel according to Paul. Um, because just like in the, the gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, where aspects of Jesus' physical life are recorded for us, similarly, Paul uh, gives and explains the theological impact of what Jesus did for us. And so at its core, the, the book of Romans is about the gospel, which is the good news. But in fact, as we saw in our introduction uh, last week, it's not just good news. It, it's the best news that you will ever hear. It's the best news that anybody's ever had. It's fantastic news. And, and the book of Romans explain what, ha, what God has done for us, what God has done, and, and what, not only what God has done for us, but what God desires to do in us. So, also, Romans is, in our, is our explanation uh, uh, for the need of the gospel, how God met that need, how the gospel works. Now, having said all of that, I mean, a, a lot of people, really, if you talk to people today, a lot of people don't think they need the gospel. I mean, and, and there are a lot of reasons out there, but primarily one big reason stands out more than any other, and that is this. If people don't uh, think they need the good news, is because they really don't understand the other end of it. They really don't understand that there really is bad news. Bad news. Now, what, what people will say is, well, how could a, a loving God judge anyone? I mean, how could a loving God judge anybody, let alone send them to an eternal hell? And if the truth be known, it, it seems that in our day, and I'm just going to just real talk here at Life Church, the doctrine of God's wrath has fallen on hard times in our culture. In fact, I mean, honestly, to put it in the vernacular of our, uh, of our current society, the idea that God actually judges people seems so intolerant. I mean, in fact, to take it a little bit further, uh, ours is a day where we have set ourselves up as human beings, as people, as the judge, and somehow foolishly, we believe that God's character is on trial. And, and the result is, is we find ourselves asking questions, culturally at least, how can a, a just God send people to hell? I mean, if God is a, such a loving father, I mean, how can he punish his son on the cross? I mean, really? One popular writer equates the whole doctrine of, of penal substitutionary atonement, and some of you are like, what in the world is that? What I mean by that is the doctrine that the Bible teaches about our sin being laid on Jesus. How many of you are thankful that your sin was laid on Jesus and it's not all up to you? I mean, so, I mean, the, the truth is, is, I mean, God the Father punished God the Son for our sins. One writer labels that particular event, he calls it this, he says, in our, in our modern, modern day, he calls it divine child abuse. I mean, I'm just going to say this. Others will ask questions like, you know, well, why is God so angry? I mean, and those questions are, uh, and others like them make going through this book for you and I very, very important. If you're a Christian, you need to understand the book of Romans. I mean, I, because truth is, there, there is no good news without bad news. So, 
the bad news of God's judgment, and not only on sin in general, but sp- particularly this morning, I want to talk about this, particularly the this, this sinner. I mean, so Romans 1.18, all the way through chapter 3, you'll see this uh, as the weeks play out. Um, Paul demonstrates and explains the universality of the human of human sin and guilt. In other words, we all have it. You and all, you and I are, we are all born with sin. I mean, and like a, a prosecuting attorney, what Paul does is he builds his case, takes us to the point of Romans chapter 3, verse 10, where he eventually says this. He says, there is no one who's not guilty. I mean, there is no one who is righteous. There is not even one that is righteous. Or even later in that same chapter, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And again, it's a universal problem sin is. So now as we look at Romans chapters 1 and 2 and 3, and we're not going to do that today, which we, won't, we can't cover that today because it's just not possible. But I want you to kind of see ahead a little bit because Div- Paul divides humanity into four groups. And you can see this in the Life Church Emporia app that Pastor TR was talking about just a moment ago if you want to follow along with the notes. But it, it, the first one is, j- just for all practical intents and purposes, the guilt of the Gentiles. That, that certainly describes... All of Western civilization, it describes Europe, it describes North America. Uh, Secondly, the second group of people he breaks it up into is the guilt of the moralist. And if you see in in chapter 2, Paul deals with the person who's uh, a moralist that says this. He says, you know what, you know, don't judge me. Uh, I'm a good person. I do good things. In fact, I am a lot better than a lot of people I know. I mean, that's, that's who he's talking to. And then, thirdly, there's a third group of people that he's talking to, and it's in chapter 2 through uh, chapter 3, and then Paul addresses later, he says it talks about the self-righteous Jewish person who says, you know what, well, I'm a child of Abraham. I mean, I'm a child of Abraham. I mean, I mean, how can God judge me? I mean, what is he, who does he think he is? I mean, and then there's a fourth group, the entire human race. From chapter 3 and verse 9 through 20, he takes on the entire human race, and he finishes his case against humanity. And, and, and in each section, what you'll notice is, is what Paul does is he, he begins by reminding them of their knowledge of God and his goodness. And then he confronts that particular group to the fact that they've not lived up to it. How many of you know that you can look down the aisle and say, hey, I mean, there is such a thing as righteousness and God has that. But here's the deal. You and I have all fallen short, have we not? I mean, you can look down the row, and there's people that, you know, we've all sinned. I mean, not only we have not lived up to it, but people actually suppress the truth. I mean, putting the truth under tyranny, if you will. I mean, contradicting the truth, uh, squashing it, uh, squelching the truth, quelling the truth, whatever term you want to use to say that. As a result, they are People are guilty. We are guilty before, uh, we're without excuse before God. And so I want to look at it, verse 18, where Paul writes this, already having given us a powerful introduction last week, already having told us he's not ashamed of the gospel, Paul is not, because it's the power of God for salvation, for it is the righteousness from God that's revealed. Now Paul explains mankind's need for the gospel. And I want you to see this, because every individual's need for the gospel, every single one of us, every single person out there, every single person on the planet, verse 18, we need the gospel. And so Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. I mean, we don't hear much in our day in popular church culture about the whole idea of God's wrath. I mean, but I want to remind you that God's wrath is as much of a part of who he is as is his, all the things we like to talk about, his love, his mercy, his grace, his patience, his goodness, his greatness. I mean, we like to talk about how great our God is. How many of you, when we uh, talk about, I can get you excited about who God is. I can get you excited about, man, the, the goodness of God. How many of you have had God deliver you from something difficult? Or how many of you have had God save you or bring you out of a, a trial or a difficulty? I mean, we can talk about the goodness of God all day long, but when it comes to God's wrath, it's like cricket, cricket, chirp, chirp. I mean, 
It's becoming increasingly harder in our day for people to accept the idea of God's wrath. In fact, people often walk away from Christianity when they hear this concept saying things like, well, I'm, a, I'm not in on that one. I just don't agree with that one. And, or, or, you know, they want to change Christian teaching. I mean, they want to exclude it or they want to reduce it uh, to where in some sectors of Christianity, I'm just going to say this because uh, it, it, we see what's known as the red letter gospel or the red letter teaching that says, well, if, if, if we just follow what Jesus said, and it, even at that, God is progressively revealing himself. So those things that we don't agree with, in the Bible, those things that we find distasteful, uh, those things that we feel that aren't meaningful to our society, we just simply erase that verse. And so, here's the deal though. The Bible doesn't allow us to do that. I mean, so, so how do we understand the wrath of God and what is God's wrath? Here's what most people make their mistake when it comes to understanding the wrath of God. We have a tendency, not only with God's wrath, but really to all of God's attributes, we have a, a tendency to frame them and define them within the realm of human personality. Uh, so so when, it, when, it, when, it begins, uh, when that begins to happen, it kind of begins to, to muddy the water at times and, or we have a tendency to try to process God's love in the framework, in the framework of human relationships or God's kindness or God's patience or God's mercy. And the same is true when it comes to the wrath of God so that when you and I hear the phrase wrath of God, we immediately go in our mind to some emotional response that is irrational, it's uncontrolled, it, like it's some sort of outburst or vindictive, cruel, selfish, uh, selfish, mean-spirited uh, fit that we throw, like God somehow flies into a rage, and, or that he's uncontrolled, he's, he's cruel, he's mean, he's hateful, he's malicious, or somehow he's spiteful. Maybe it would help us to think of it this way. I want you to see this because I think it's important. The op opposite of wrath isn't love. I want you to think about this. The opposite of wrath is actually neutrality. The opposite of wrath is actually a, a disinterested, passive indifference of what's happening to someone else. I mean, so, so just so you understand, when it comes to evil, let me just help you with this. God is not neutral when it comes to evil. He hates evil. He, he does not like evil evil. Look at verse 18 again, Romans 1, 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against who? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, but who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. I mean, when God exercises his wrath against evil, understand this, what, what that is saying is God is a holy kind of hostile, if you will, toward evil. So, so that what, what that really means is he, he refuses to condone it, he refuses to actually come to some sort of agreement with it. I mean, he refuses to let it exist passively where, you know, somehow God does his thing and evil does its thing. God is not neutral toward evil. And that, my friends, is why he actually judges it. God's wrath, his, his, his active opposition to evil, and not just evil in general, but his opposition to and punishment of the ungodly and unrighteous behavior of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So what that, re so what that really means is this. I mean, that, that you and I would do well, I mean, not to go too far with, uh, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of I know a lot of Christians and a lot of people around me. We have Christians in our church this way too, but I've met a lot of them, and some of them are way worse than other places that I've been. Uh, you know, they're, they're those kind of Christians that use a lot of cliches. And, and I'm just going to say this because cliches and, and theology don't always mix. And so uh, we would do really well to understand this when it comes to the wrath of God, uh, just so we know and we understand as a general rule, uh, cliches and, and, and theology don't mix. So, so you have to be careful with phrases like this one. How many of you have ever heard of this phrase? Let me just clarify this for us. God is against all sin, and he is also against all unrepentant sinners. And when we hear this, 
We go, oh my goodness, I can't believe. In the culture we live in, Pastor Tony, you just said something very evil. How can he dare say he's against me? I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're living in sin, God is against you. I mean, that's just the facts. I mean, so, and listen, he's going to judge that. I mean, so, well, PT, I've heard that Carrie Job sing that song, He's For Me, and, and I'm just fine, and because somebody prayed over me, and, I, you know, it, yeah, if you're saved, if you're walking with the Lord. I mean, so maybe you're like, well, I doubt that. I mean, we'll, we'll look at it in, in 2 Thessalonians. There's other places in the Gospels that we see this. In, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, when the Lord Jesus was revealed from heaven which hit with his mighty angels, now look at this. We like to read in flaming fire. Uh, we like to think that God's on fire, or like, ooh, he's this lot out on fire you know we like to think of i can't remember the the words there but anyway you know we, <laughs> we like to think of things being on fire as a good no, no 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 this is not good fire okay so with his mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting what god's wrath on those who do not know god yikes and on those and those who do not obey the gospel of our lord jesus so I understand it here again. It, it, God is not just actively opposed toward the concept of evil, and, but also to people who have actually rejected him and have pursued evil. God's wrath is, is poured out on them also. I don't say that this morning like, ha ha. I don't say that like, because I mean, listen, before I came to Christ, I mean, and still even yet, there is going to be a day I stand before the Lord, and that is not one thing I take lightly. That's not something that I'm going to, oh, that'll be fun. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, it's not going to be a party. Let me grab a beer and stand before the Lord. Ha, <laughs> ha, yeah. Really? I mean, people have rejected him and they've pursued him. And, and it's important to understand the gospel to once again reaffirm that God is not only actively opposed to evil, but also to all those who practice evil. To, to sinners. And listen, let me just tell you something. That's really, really, really bad news. I mean, that's really not good. It's shocking that the Bible says that. I mean, it's startling news. Now, back to Romans 1.18. I want you to see it. You say, well, why is that, PT? Because it's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men. What? Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Notice not, it's not just the fact that they do wrong. It's, it's that they actually know better. Know better, Pastor? How in the world would they know better? I mean, they, 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 they stifle any truth that challenges their own behavior, Romans says. They question any truth that goes against their own lifestyle, their opinions, their choices. You know, leave me alone. It's my life. They refuse to accept God as the final word. In fact, they say, well, who needs, who needs God? Well, I mean, why do I need God? And they ignore God's presence and his majesty and his sovereignty. And not only to say, that's, that's not just to say this, that his right to, to rule and reign in, in general, but also that it actually reigns in our lives in particular. That he actually reigns in us. And so that's, that's really the truth that Paul is talking about when we see this. And I want you to see two more verses here, verses 18 and 20 through 20. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can be known about God, listen to this, is plain to them. What you need to understand is what Paul is talking about here. What Paul is going to show us is that when God judges sinners, he judges them based on what they know. And so not everyone will know the gospel. I mean, granted that, that's a, that's a given. But listen, he is righteousness, or he is righteous, and in his righteous judgment, uh, he will judge peace people based on what they did with what they knew about him. Because listen to this, and you can see the rest of the verse. Because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Listen, in what? In the things that are have been made. So they're without excuse. Paul, Paul is saying that the revealing of God is not only by way of the Bible, by his word in scripture, but long God, long before the scripture was written, had revealed himself in nature. I mean, one guy said it this way. He said, the whole universe is but the footprint of the divine goodness. I mean, in other words, all you have to do is if you want to see 
the goodness of God, that there is a God and he does exist, just look around at nature itself. I mean, just look around at the stars, look at the seasons, look at a day like today. I mean, the fact that he is able to bring all of that in process and and bring around life itself, all creation, it declares the glory of God. I mean, you look at our planet. I mean, think about this for a second. If you were to go around our uh, earth approximately 25,000 miles in circumference, I mean, you think about that, and yet it weighs six septillion, 588 sextillion tons. Now think about that. I mean, some of us are like, uh, think about that really like we can. You know, I'm, I'm one of those because I'm not a math person, but listen. But it hangs in space. Now think about that. I mean, further, it spins at 1,000 miles an hour. It careens through space at the speed of 1,000 miles per minute. I mean, you start looking at all these facts. Think of all of the rain we've had in 2020. Now, I know there's different years where there's different amounts, but listen, 2020 would have turned Lyon County into a swimming pool that was 855 miles squared and was almost three feet deep. I, I want you to think about that for a second. There has to be something else involved besides just, oh, oops. I'm just saying, it, it, take, take the marvels of the human body. I mean, you, you, the Bible says we, have, we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. I mean, the, the size of the human heart is but the size of a fist, and yet it does enough work in 12 hours alone to lift 65 tons one inch off the ground. I mean, the very world in which we live, the, the body in which we are housed, the various aspects of creation, the, the planet, the atmosphere, the inhabitants all speak to the fact that there is intelligent design behind that which there is an intelligent designer. And outside of the fact that he is an obvious designer and sheer planner in creation, he is also to be revered and to be worshipped. And so Paul says it, man in his sinful depravity, man in his selfishness, man in his like, I don't really care, they, he won't do that. He refuses to do it. Man, he refuses to acknowledge God's sovereign rule or even his power. And what happens is, is as Paul walks through this, he, there is a spiral down, I want you to see. As a person is in, unwilling to acknowledge God, the, the God of the Bible revealed to us through creation first, then through his word. When, I, when a person says, I will not acknowledge him, I'm doing it my way. Paul says, well, there's a, sp- a downward spiral that happens. And there's three steps, and I, I'm going to take us through these uh, downward spiral of sin steps. I mean... Well, the first one you can see if you're taking notes, it's, it's the non-recognition that leads to repression. It, it's, by the way, it's really, kind of a, it's really kind of non-recognition that is really ungrateful. It, it's an ingratitude that kind of leads to a, a squashing or a squelching that idea that God is even there. I mean, that God is even around. I mean, look at verse 21. It says this, for although they knew God. So listen, they, they knew there was a God. I mean, they knew that he existed. They knew he was there and that he created the cosmos. But notice, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. There's a a complete lack of gratitude there. And in gratitude, it says, you know what? You know what, God? I'm not going to honor you. I'm not going to thank you. I'm not going to have you. You know what? You can just keep... You can keep that, that thought. You can, I mean, I'm, I don't want anything to do with it. There's a complete lack of, of gratitude there. And ingratitude says, you know what, I'm not going to honor you, nor I'm, I'm not going to thank you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. So what happens in very informs, people play games with God, and so that, that, that they'll say sometimes, well, PT, I, I mean, I believe there is a God. I mean, I believe, there's a, I believe there is a God, and, but there's a huge difference in believing in the existence of God and actually allowing him to be God in your own life. So it's, it's usually not because they don't really believe that there isn't a God. Sometimes even expressing the grief, or excuse me, the, the grief, uh, expressing the, the uh, certain truths about God in their, own, in their own mind, you know, maybe they, uh, even believing in the Trinity, uh, with Jesus being a part of that Trinity, they'll even say that, but they, they just rather him not be in charge of their life. I, I believe there's God, but I just don't, I mean, I just really don't have much to do with him. 
Well, here's the logic, and it's important to understand this. If there is a God that ordered the planet, and he also created you, then just as he design, has a design for the planet, he also has a design for you as well. Therefore, since, listen, he is greater than you, has created you, has a plan for you, you must submit to his will and you must obey him and you must worship him as God because, listen, he's worthy of that. So think about it this way. There, there is either no God and all of this that we see is by accident or there is a God and he has designed everything that you and I see and even a lot more that we don't see and we owe him our allegiance and our awe. I mean, when I say awe, everybody say awe. <laughs> I mean, that kind of awe. I mean, he's like, man, wow, God, you're unbelievable. You're amazing. You're awesome. How many of you know what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, there, that, that being said, here's the Christian perspective. The Christian gets up in the morning and says this, I have a God who created me on purpose and he created me with a purpose. He loves me so much that he actually reached out to me and he made a way for me long before I was ever born that I might know him and he sent his son to die for me and to take my place and to bear the punishment of my sin. He paid a debt I could never ever pay. I will never be able to repay him for all the good he's done for me, all the good he's doing for me, uh, his love, his mercy, his grace are all too wonderful to tell I mean every single day is a gift from him and I'm going to live for him and I'm going to love him back and I'm going to worship him and I'm going to serve him and I'm going to use all of my energy actually to glorify him that people might know him around me so is that you is that how you live rhetorical question is that how you live your Christian life I'm asking this today because if it's not it should be. If, if you're a Christian, that should be how you live. The non-Christian says this, though. Let me just show you this. I'm my own person. I mean, I do what I want. I do what I want. I do it how I want. I do it when I want. And if there is a God, or in fact there may be a God, I mean, I'm not really sure his power can even have any bearing on my life. So I'm really kind of like, you know, mm, come see, come sign about the Lord, mm, whatever. I'll give it, take it, mm, whatever. Just, just don't get in the way of me doing what I want to do. And consequently, listen, that person just kind of, really what happens is, is they just kind of carve out their own life and their own lifestyle. And for some, that means that they are a nice person. Uh, be, because honestly, how many of you know that being nice actually has its rewards? I mean, how many of you have ever met a grumpy Christian? I have. They need to let their... They need to let the gospel affect that part of them, don't they not? I mean, I'm just saying, you know? So, you know, honestly, being nice has its own rewards. I mean, I, I, I've met a lot of people who are not believers in Christ who are super nice people, and, and I mean, think about it for a second. Who, they, 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 who hasn't, I mean, of us in here, who hasn't benefited from us being nice? I mean, it's something that people, how many of you have been liked before because you're a nice person? How many of you would say that? How many of you would say you're a grumpy person and you've been disliked before because you were grumpy? Okay, good job. Way to be honest before the Lord. That'll be another series. But anyway, so, you know, so, I mean, and sometimes what happens is, is we're like, you know, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. You know, or I mean, at least I'm, I'm not as bad as they are. Plus, you know what? I helped the lady cross the street. I actually mowed a, uh, my lawn on time. I watched the kids for my wife. And not only that, it gave her a day off. And I'm a pretty good person if you ask me. For others, you know, it's, it's a matter of social acceptance. I mean, so if I'm, a, if I'm a nice person, the word will get out about me being nice and, and people will like me and in certain circles that would cause you to be accepted and make you get included, which is fine, but it, may, it might even cause sometimes even promotion at your job. See, I, I'm a nice person. See, you know, I, still others, they'll say this. They'll say, you know, wh you know what, I, I'm my own person. I do what I want. And if I can get away with evil... That's fine. If I can get away with doing something wrong, as long as it meets my needs, uh, then it's all good. If it's something I want and I don't have it and I can't get it any other way, I will get it. I will steal it. Then so be it. I will do that. And, and whatever I can get away with to make sure I get to provide for my family. All that to say, listen, 
that if people don't honor God, nor thank Him, nor acknowledge Him, they are repressing the truth of creation that there is a God and He deserves our praise. That repression, it actually leads to the second thing in the downward spiral, and that's darkness. So it's, it's gone from, listen, it's gone from ingratitude, that attitude of non-recognition, I'm, I'm not going to give him praise, I'm not going to honor him, I'm not going to do any of that, and that leads to repression. And repression, listen, it leads to this darkness. Look at it in verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But, and I want you to see this, and watch this, they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. They became, look at this, futile. What's futile? Well, futile is the idea that it, it's really not of any purpose. It's, it's, it's pointless. I mean, Christianity teaches, listen, can I tell you, Christianity teaches that we were created in Christ with a purpose. And, and mainly that biggest purpose is to know him. It's to know Christ. I mean, but, but if a person, listen, if a person rejects God as the creator and has a, a, a purpose for the, who has a purpose for their lives, then immediately what happens is, is individually, your life, my life, it begins to lack divine purpose. And the purpose of your life is now decided by you. Furthermore, if there is not a God who powerfully created the universe and is personally involved in, in the carrying out of purposes, there is no right and no wrong, and there is no moral authority, and things begin to come, become very, very dark. So let me help you understand this. Either there is a designer who designed all of this and as such is in charge, or there is darkness and we do what we want, and really, there is no middle ground. I mean, so, thirdly, I want you to see this. Non-recognition or ingratitude leads to repression. Repression leads to darkness. And then darkness, what happens? It leads to every kind of problem imaginable, imaginable to man. And this is Paul's argument. His reasoning. I mean, the problems can't be broken. I, they, can, they can be broken up a lot of different ways. But I want you to see three basic categories of problems here. And the first one is this. Idolatry. Idolatry is this. When a person substitutes some created thing in place of the one position that only God should occupy, that's what idolatry is. Let me say that again because some of you are writing, idolatry is when a person substitutes some created thing in place of one, the one position that only God should occupy. I mean, so Romans 1, verse 22 and 23, you can see it. I mean, claiming to be wise, they became... Fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. I mean, and then verse 25, you can see it because they exchanged the truth about, what, about God for a lie. And look at this. And they worshiped and they served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I mean, here's, here's the truth about humanity. And this goes with every single human being out there. You'll either worship the creator or or you will worship a created thing. Well, uh, Pastor Tony, go ahead and preach it. Uh, uh, keep, keep it up, Pastor. Keep up preaching. No, go ahead. Just cricket, cricket. I mean, you're either gonna you're either gonna worship the creator of the universe, or you're gonna worship something that he created. I mean, and whatever. Listen, whatever you worship, you're gonna serve. Because we've been created with that sense, something or someone to live for. In fact, they say, I mean, if, in fact, you, if you take that away from them, they will die. I mean, every person has to be able to say, hey, listen, if I have this, or if I have that, life is worth living. If I have blank, and whatever you put in that blank is what you worship. Some people worship people. Some people worship that special friend. Some people worship security. Some people worship position. Some people worship recreational activity, golf, fishing, Chiefs football. Oh, no, I don't want to say that. Never, ever. Oh, no, not those people. Listen, I'm just saying this. I don't care what it is. 
I mean, some people worship things like personal freedom. Some people worship things like favorite activity or even alcohol. I mean, listen, this morning, maybe, they, maybe you are here and you're like, I like comfort. I just want to be comfortable. That's really what my goal in life is. Idolatry is when we make our life about something other than God. And you will see this with Paul in other writings. In one place he says this, to live is Christ. The challenge for Christianity, listen, I'm going to tell you this this morning. I want all of us to hear this because I think it's so important. This is such a huge deal. Listen, the challenge for Christianity is simply this. They say Christ is their blank in their box. A lot of Christians in America, they say, yeah, to live is Christ. And then we try to think, then to die is great gain. Woohoo! yeah. Okay. Okay. But the truth is, is most of us live it like this. Christ plus my family. Christ plus my nice car. Christ plus that good job I got. If I don't have that job, well, you can forget Christ. Christ plus. Think about it. Listen, and pe- people don't want to, I say this because to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And if living is Christ, then dying is only completely gain. Otherwise, listen, people don't want to die because they will, leave, they will leave what they love behind. I mean, so, but if living, listen, if living is Christ plus, then dying, maybe at best, is gain and loss. But, but th- th- there's a second category I want you to see of problems that darkness creates. And what happens is once people are ungrateful, which, is, which leads to a, uh, a repression, which then re- repression leads to darkness, uh, people uh, replace God with other things. Uh, they start worshiping other, those other things. They, they start serving those other things. And what happens is, is then uh, life, here's what happened. Life gets flipped up, up right upside down. Can I ask you this question? Does anybody else see this in our culture today besides me? I'm just saying this. Do we not think that things are inverted right now? I'm not talking about corona. I'm talking about just life in general. If you look at people's lives, I mean, just leave me alone. I don't want anything. I just want my life, and I want you to leave me alone. That's life. I mean, life gets flipped upside down, and and listen, there is an inversion, and life gets turned on its head, and it no longer functions like it's supposed to. Romans 1, verse 24, look at this for a second. Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another, outside of the boundary, listen, I'm just going to say this, outside, we got kids in the room today, outside of the boundary of relationships of marriage, okay, it degrades, and this happens every time, Pastor TR, I am not kidding, it happens every stinking time, I go through a passage of scripture, the kids are going to be in the room, anyway, so I'm just saying, there's a degrading of a person's humanity that happens when you have relationships that are listed outside of marriage, it's degrading humanity, you may, what, how, how dare you say that's degrading, I'm not saying it, God says it, I mean, you, you won't hear this on Oprah. You won't hear it on Ellen. You won't hear it on The View. You certainly won't hear it nowadays. But even first and foremost, among our secular universities, you're not going to hear this. Whereas being in connection in the biblical way, that's a good way to put it, because there's kids in here, it only upgrades humanity. It, it does it because it's God's purpose. It's God's plan. In illicit relationships, what, what people do is they use one another. They're like, you know what, I, I can get what I get out of you. You know, people don't like to admit it. Uh, it could be for pleasure, could be for security, could be for whatever reason. It, it, it's about a barter, which degrades their humanity to a commodity to be, to be used. Marriage, on the other hand, it b- is based on a desire for the other's wholeness. It's for the other person's joy. It's for the other person's blessing. It's appropriately and in God's design. And illicit relationships is just one for the for one of the examples because it's not obviously it's not the only example. But look at it in verse twenty six. Paul says that he says for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relationships. Relations with women and were confused or consumed with passion for one another, 
men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And you can see the picture here. You can see this, this whole thing. This is how things, this is just one little area that, that it happens in. Now, I mean, you can be sure that this is referring to the sin of homosexuality, but for Paul's purposes, it's not just about that. I mean, rather, he wants to show you just how twisted life can become when you reject God's truths. I mean, it's just a fact. That's how it is. Here's, here's why. Can I tell you something? God made you. You're fearfully and you're wonderfully made. Well, you, how can you say that, Pastor? I don't even know how you think you are telling me that God made me. I mean, my parents made me. Who do you think make your parents? I mean, who do you think made your parents? I mean, you go back and you keep going back and you had to get to the original somebody. Guess who that was? Adam and Eve. So I'm just saying, you want to go all the way back. I mean, that, that's what happens to societies that reject God. As Sarah and the team come back, I want to give the third category of problems that created by darkness, and that's iniquity. Notice where all these lead. Notice where all this leads. Verse 28. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Let me put it this way. God's active wrath is expressed most frequently by Him simply giving people what it is that they want. You want this? Okay. You want to sleep with dogs? There'll be fleas. Go ahead. I mean, that's what you want? Go, go ahead. I mean, you can also look at hell that same way. You want to think about it this way. You want no presence of the Lord in your life? You don't want no presence of God in your life? I mean, listen, hell is exactly that. The absence of God's presence. And God's like, you want to do your own thing away from me? Okay, but I don't think you're going to like that. And in that sense, it becomes a, listen, in that sense, it becomes a very frightening, frightful thing for God to give you everything that you ever wanted. By the time you get to Romans chapter 1 verse 29, Paul gives a list of 21 different things that are sinful, sinful sins. They, 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 will fill, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. I mean, they were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Sound like a familiar culture to you? Listen, as you look down at this list, most of our tendencies in this room, you look at something like gossip or covetousness, and think, boy, I sure am glad I'm not one of those murderers. <laughs> yeah. Woo. I mean, I might be covetous, but, you know, at least I'm not a murderer. And here's what happens. We do that because we try to protect ourselves, try to make ourselves feel better about our own sin. Because here's the deal. Every single one of us have sin in our lives. You're like, Pastor, are you saying you got sin in your life? Yeah, I have to deal with that regularly. I have to come to Jesus with that every, every time I turn around. So how many of you know what I'm talking about? If you're a Christian, you, you understand that, you know, there, I'm not perfect yet. Someday we get to heaven, and there's going to be perfection. We're going to be like he is, and that's going to be great. But listen, the, I am continually conforming to the image of God that we see in the Bible continually saying, you know what, Lord, change me, make me, make me like you. And it's a continual relationship, you know. And, and so 
Listen, there's no big sins, there's no small sins. There are different natural repercussions for different sins, some worse, some, some not as bad, but let's, let's be clear. All sins separate us from God. And Paul makes no distinction in this list. Sin is sin. And when we violate God's standard, it puts humanity in the path of God's righteous judgment. And that's what Paul eventually says. He says, all have sinned. I mean, now look at Romans 1.32. It says this. Though they knew, know God's decrees, that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, they actually give approval to those who practice them. Not only does the, 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 the world do them, but then listen, the, the word for approval there, if you look at it, it's, it's, it holds this idea here. It's like, oh, hey, <laughs> you're back there sinning? Oh, yeah, all right, yeah. Hey, keep it up, man. Keep on sinning. Woo, isn't that great? I love it when people do things that I like to do. Same idea. So, really what we're talking about in closing, I, I want to leave you with some closing thoughts, and that's this. The design, first one's this. The design declares a designer. The design of our world is clear. It's clearly seen. There is no excuse. When, when you stand before God, listen, there, there, there has been ev given every tree, every baby born, everything that you've ever seen on this planet, God has given man no excuse. I mean, you won't be able to hide anything from him because he's designed you and he knows everything about you and his creation, you and everything around you requires that something greater outside of you and me has been created in all of this by a wonderful designer. Secondly, the day we live in is really a depiction of God's wrath. You may say, how so? I mean, God's wrath is not fully, yes, yes, I understand that. Don't think of God's wrath as, as it's coming one day and, and, and it will. Yes, ultimately, God's wrath would be eternal punishment in hell. But remember, the text is in the present tense. The wrath of God is being revealed against all people. Why? God's given them what they want. I mean, we're seeing that to a degree right now that is actually unbelievable in our culture. And if it doesn't cause you to realize your need for God, and I mean, cultural societies, when they fall apart, when I started in the ministry, I'm just saying this because if I simply would have described what we see happening today in the United States back in like the early 90s, I'm going to tell you right now, everybody would have looked at me and thought I was just trying to scare them half to death. But the truth is, is God's wrath is happening on people all the time. And it affects people. I mean, what, what you have to decide about the gospel, what have you, what will you decide about the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, for all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. Romans 3.10, listen, no one is righteous. So your decision to serve God determines your eternal destiny. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What a promise. I mean, because, because God is good, he's just. Because he's just, he, he will righteously oppose evil and judge it. And you can either keep going down that path of evil, listen, or you can reject that evil by accepting God's gift, allowing God's gift to you, Jesus Christ, the one who took your place to bear the punishment for your sin. Jesus on the cross. And as a result, best news ever. God put all your sin on Jesus and treated him on the cross like you and I should have been treated and then he turns around and he treats you actually like Jesus deserved to be treated because he was sinless. What are you going to do with that exceptionally great news? What are you going to do? This morning, heads bowed, eyes closed this morning. There are those in this room and you'd say, you know what, up to this point, you've been living for yourself. Maybe there are those online and you're sitting in your living room and up to this point, you've, you've really pretty much ignored God. You haven't worshipped Him as God. You've determined that, you know, 
you want what you want. You've done things your own way. You've rejected God's provision in your life and you haven't allowed his gift, Jesus Christ, to bear the punishment for your sins. In fact, listen, inadvertently, maybe you've ultimately rejected the cross and as a result, I mean, the wrath of God is on your life. Listen, the only way to remove God's wrath is submitting yourself to God's plan. Is submitting yourself to his way, his plan of sending his son, Jesus Christ, to take your place where he who knew no sin became sin and became a sacrifice for us all to accept that sacrifice, to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to deny your own desires and take up God's plan, the plan of the cross, repenting of all of your sin and submitting your life completely over to God for good. Today, I just have to say this wonderfully good news in spite of what you've done in the past. Today, you sense that God is talking to you today. You realize that God is drawing you to himself. He's wooing you. That sense this morning that, man, you're, you're like maybe your palms are getting sweaty or you're nervous and you're worried about what's going to happen next. Listen, he is drawing you to himself today. And this morning, you admit you want to repent of all of your sin and you want to take up God's plan for your life where you die to yourself, you die to your old ways, and you allow him to be the Lord of your life today. Online or whether it's right here in person, you're here today, and that's you. You need Jesus Christ. You want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You're here today, and you'd say, that's me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Right now, you would just slip your hand up before the Lord right where, right where you are. Right here in this place. Yes. There's two right here. Are there others? I believe there are still others in this place. I believe that there are people maybe online right now and you're sitting in your living room and, you know, you may think, well, the pastor can't really see me. That's not really about me seeing you. Listen, I'm telling you right now, it's all about God seeing that hand and your, God sees your heart beyond the hand. This morning, you're here and you'd slip your hand up before God and you would respond to him. He's giving you his grace. It's his mercy in your life at work right now. Listen, I promise you, that's uh, embarrassment's not the goal. Your surrender, the surrender of your heart is, the, is, the, is what, what God's after this morning. You're here and you'd say, I need to surrender to the Lord. We've got two and I'm thankful for two, but yes. Are there others still? Yes, right here. Yeah, I'm saying this because I think there might have been a little hand go up in the back. I don't want to leave up, leave out anybody today. Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. He's a good God and he cares about you and he doesn't want you to die in your sin. One last moment. What a perfect day to respond to God's love. Yes. God sees your hand. Yes. God's good. God's good. Yes. What a perfect day. Yeah. Another hand going up. Yeah. God's good. He's so good. He's drawing you to himself today. He wants you to make him Lord of your life today. What a what a wonderful thing this morning. perfect day to respond to God's love, is it not church? Yeah. Right now, if good intentions were all there was, then raising her hand would be fine, right? Right? But I'm, I'm going to say this. It's important that we call on God. And so I want to lead you in the process of calling on God this morning. Right now, I want you to do something with me. I want you to stand before the Lord. Could we do that today? We're going to admit our need for God. These that have raised their hands, I, lo- I, don't, I have no idea. I lost count. I have no idea. But I, here's what I do know. 
is every last person matters. That's what I know. Every person that didn't raise their hand and still is running from God, you matter. Every single person in here that's already committed yourself to God, you matter. I'm just saying, we all to God, his call is for everyone. And so right now, we're going to repent. We need to recant. I, I don't want to live in sin anymore. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That you've, you've asked Jesus in your life, and man, he can, he can do a work in you. What, what's amazing about Jesus, can I just tell you this? He gives you a want to. There is a miracle that happens, and he gives you that desire. And you need to begin to feed that desire. The word of God will begin to grow. I'm telling you, if somebody talks to you today and you're, they invite you to a class or they invite you to a grow class or they invite you to a cup of coffee or whatever the case, let me just tell you, take them up on it because let me just tell you something. It's a, it's a way to gain not just family, but it's also a way to gain and learn a little bit more about the Lord. And the more we learn about God, the more we really begin to do as God instructs us in the word, it's, it's just this wonderful relationship. And then we have this, can I, can I just tell you, can you look around real quick? This is family. This is, this is God, this is a family. I mean, it's not the whole, it's not the whole church in Emporia. I mean, obviously there's other Bible-believing churches in, in town, but let me just tell you, this, we're part of the family of God, are we not? And so that's an exciting big family that I never had before. Can I just tell you, this pastor's really excited about having lots of family. So, so, and here's the thing, we're adding to that family this morning. So, so, all of us, I know there's several that are going to ask Jesus into their life. You're going to make him Lord of your life. You're going to pray that in a prayer. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And all of us are going to pray it with you this morning. Can we do this right now? Dear Jesus... I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit I'm a sinful person. I also admit my need for you. So today I repent of all my sin. And I turn my life completely over to you. Come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Fill my deep need for you. Thank you for saving me. For being my savior. Now help me to follow you. All the days of my life. In Jesus name. And everybody in the house said. Let's give God glory. Can we do that right now? Thank you God. God is good. Well, folks, let me just tell you something. Jesus, his gospel is real and it's still active and it's still working. God saves people and he's doing it all over the world. I'm thankful to be a part of his kingdom. Amen, church? So I want us to do something before we go. Can we just do this? I mean, some of you might be, feel led to clap. Some of you might feel led to just lift your hands to God, but I want to worship him one last time because this, this, the whole reason we're here is to give him glory. So right now, I just want to do that, and however you can do that this morning, I just want to thank you, God. Lord, we worship you. We glorify your name. Lord, you are worthy of all praise. We revere you, God. We worship you. We exalt your name. We pronounce you, Lord, over us, O oh God. Thank you, God. Thank you. I know your kingdom is not in this world, and I thank you, God, that we belong to a kingdom that never ends with the king who is just and righteous and good and holy and right. Thank you, God, for being our awesome Savior. Thank you, God. We worship you, King. You're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're so good. Hallelujah. Isn't he good, church? Amen. Amen.
What, did you say 10 minutes? Okay. Guys, thank you for being here so much today. God is so good. I know we've got a little time, and we're going to try to be as gracious as we possibly can, but we got a business meeting now, and that doesn't mean kick, kick God out. That's not what we're doing. So, uh, But I'm just telling you, man, Jesus is awesome, is he not? So that's why we're here. But God bless you. Have a great, great week, and may the Lord richly bless your life.